I would like to welcome our first speaker, Matt Waite. I don't know who I lost a bet with to have to go first, but uh, I'm going to try not to screw this up too bad. Um, my name is Matt Waite. I'm a professor in the College of Journalism. Uh, I'm an alum of the university, which I lovingly call the Harvard of the Plains. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came back and joined the faculty last year. And my interests center around the uses of technology in journalism. And uh, what I want to talk about today, I want to kind of take you through uh, a, a tour of kind of the Campbell's chunky soup of my brain, which is just all of this stuff kind of floating around up there. And every now and then, uh, two things kind of bump into each other and end up on the same spoon, and an idea is kind of formed. And um, this this whole kind of idea, and, and follow along with me. Trust me, we're going to get somewhere eventually. Uh, but this whole idea kind of started with a story that has happened way too much in this country lately for my beloved industry of newspaper. And that is, uh, I want you all to play pretend with me for just a minute. You are all now reporters, and you are all working for a newspaper, and Newsrooms are among the most rumor-riven places on earth, and so you know things aren't going well, and you know that the money is not coming in, and you know that the publisher has called an all-staff meeting. And I don't care what industry you're in, when the boss calls everybody into a room, ain't nothing good gonna happen. So here comes the publisher, and they come out, and, and immediately starts talking about how times are tough, and money's not coming in, and you know it's coming, and here it comes, the uh, publisher just laid off a big chunk of the staff. And everybody gets kind of depressed about this. And then the publisher, in a, in a very vain attempt, tries to kind of rally everybody who's still left and say, well, we still have a mission to complete. We still have a, a product to produce. And we want to make it as, as good as we can. And then the line. And, and, and I swear to you, in most newsrooms, it's almost like betting on when is the line going to come out. And that line is, we must do more with less. And at that moment, a big room full of journalists start saying words that mama raised me to not say in front of folks like you. So um, that fascinates me. That reaction absolutely fascinates me because what it means is that journalists don't believe that their processes can be optimized. That there's no way to change or improve what they do to be able to indeed do more with less. There are all kinds of industries that have a long history of being able to do this. Um, and I started thinking about what they were, and I'm thinking, well, there's manufacturing, uh, they've been able to change processes and do things using less materials, computer science has a long history of this, being able to optimize code to use less resources on a server. And then one kind of wild and crazy idea came to my head, and that was the military. The military has been dealing with trying to do more with less for a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean 200 BC, uh, Sun Tzu writes in the Art of War that fighting with a large force is no one as different than fighting with a small force. All it is is signals and signs. It's being able to communicate with your people. Now he was primarily interested in the kind of the, the, the headache of dealing with a massive force versus a smaller one that you can see, you can actually yell at, go there, go there. When you have people spread out in long, long ways. But I think actually it works in reverse. That if you can get the right people in the right place at the right time, you can be as effective as you would be with a larger force. We can move forward a couple of thousand years and get to Carl von Clausewitz writing in 1832 that uh, most of war actually happens in this kind of fog of uncertainty. You've probably heard of it shortened as the fog of war. And that the victor will ultimately be the one that is able to get more information than, than the other guy and be able to use their mind and their intellect to be able to act on that information and use it in the right frame. We can fast forward to a more recent time and, and, and kind of when I started paying attention, and, uh, and that is the Cold War. The Cold War military planning began with an idea, and it was this idea. The other guys got more stuff than we do. They got more tanks, more guns, more planes, more bombs, more everything, and at some point, they're going to come spilling over a border somewhere, and our smaller force is going to have to stop them. How? How to do that? Well, they use this idea called force multiplication. Which is, if we could give a technology to a fighting force that makes them more effective, whatever that difference is, that's called the force multiplier. And that's why we spent untold billions of dollars on smart weapons, on better tanks, on better planes, ships, all kinds of stuff. So we could make up that difference. So we could use a smaller force than a larger force. Or we could do more with less. 
So we get to the early 90s, and there is a program started within the Department of Defense called the Future Force Warrior Program. And at the time, this will seem kind of funny to you, but at the time they were going to take these really kind of crazy future technologies and bring them to the individual warfighter, to give them to the infantrymen on the ground. And they were going to take off-the-shelf products like palm pilots and uh, other things and put them on the individual warrior to make them more effective. We've been doing this to big things like ships and planes and, uh, and all kinds of things, and it just hadn't trickled down to the individual. Well, with the Future Force Warrior, we're going to do that. So we created this thing that looks like this. They would have all of these different gadgets and tools that would, one, make them uh, more aware of the battlefield, and two, they would also need better body armor, more, uh, more medical uh, abilities on them, ways to make them more effective, to keep them on the battlefield and make them smarter. But really, what they, add, what they added were um, like augmented reality. They would have a heads-up display right on their eyes so they could beam battlefield information right there, to their, right there to their face. They had advanced communications gear that would keep them in contact with all of their commanders and all of their fellow soldiers so that they could be tied in. They had battlefield awareness much, much better. They had wearable computing. They could get data and intelligence information and maps and all kinds of things sent directly to their bodies that they could carry with them. They had video gun sights. And because they had a screen on their eye and a video camera on their gun, they could literally aim it around corners and, and effectively shoot without ever having to expose themselves. Um, if you look at this and think about it, really what we're talking about here is the same thing that had been written about for thousands of years. We're talking about changing the fog of war, piercing the fog of war. We're talking about signaling and moving the right people to the right place at the right time and all of these things. And right now you're asking me, okay, great. I can read Wikipedia too. <laughs> What? What does that have to do with the future of media? Well, the great and terrible irony of the Future Force Warrior Program is they scrapped it in 2007. And they scrapped it because of batteries. They couldn't carry enough batteries into combat to stay on the whole time. And they couldn't just say, uh, excuse me, uh, bad guy, uh, I need to plug in for a little while. Can we stop shooting at each other for a little while? I recharge. The kind of hilarious irony is they did it right when we all started buying these. We started spending obscene amounts of money on these. And smartphone makers started spending a lot of money on making these live longer and do more um, all at the same time. And so I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Could we apply this idea? to journalism? Well, since 2007, there's been a lot of layoffs in newspapers. There's been more than 40,000 of them. And this is actually probably a really conservative estimate. There's probably been a lot more. There's been even more that have just said, I can't take the stress of knowing that the ax is going to fall at any moment. I'm out of here. Um, so newspapers are having to do more with a lot less. And the amount of kind of research and, and effort and vigor that they put into to making journalists more efficient has been pretty disappointing here for. Um, so I started thinking, well, what if we took this idea over here, we took this idea over here, we put them on the same spoon and we see how this bite tastes. Is there such a thing as a future force journalist? Is there something we could do? And I started looking around at technologies that were either almost available, like soon to be available, and uh, available now. And it immediately became apparent that this is entirely doable. This is entirely doable within the next few years. And it all starts with Google's Project Glass. How many of you have seen these? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think this is the coolest thing ever. You're talking about putting the internet on your eye. I think that is awesome. Now, I've got a bunch of friends who are like, this is the stupidest thing, and I'm going to laugh at you if I see you walking around campus with these things on. And I'm like, hate on, hater. I'm going to be wearing these things, and I love them. But other than a geek toy, what could you do with these things? Well, essentially, you're putting not just the internet on your eye, you're putting a smartphone on your eye. It'll have a GPS device in it, so it'll be location aware. It'll have a camera, so it'll be directionally and, and visually aware. I could create an app that would 
would say geolocate every crime in the city in real time. And a journalist could go to cover a, say there's some gang violence in a neighborhood and somebody ended up dead. They could go to that neighborhood and just look around and on the screen would be the assault that started this, the drug dealing that was going on, uh, another incident just across the street. Imagine having these and walking around campus and being able to look at a bike rack and seeing that it had a bike theft rate three times in excess of that one over there. Where are you going to park your bike? Not here. Um, that kind of augmented reality, layering a layer of data over top of real life could be exceptionally powerful for a lot of disciplines. Uh, one that I'm fascinated by because I've been uh, an interest in civil war history is so imagine being able to stand on top of a little round top of Gettysburg and look down and see the Confederates charging up the hill in your glasses. That would be wild. It would be amazing. But as a generalist tool, we're talking about bringing in the steady flow of real life right onto your face. But if we do that, we need to have something to feed it. We can create software bots to do that. Now, software bots open up kind of, a, kind of a philosophical question about what is news. And news, to me, in at least some regard, is when things are different. There is so much of daily life that goes on that is just supposed to happen that way. And that we don't ever really pay attention to it until it's different. Well, a software bot can be trained to listen for the mayor to be arrested or uh, a political, uh, some, uh, a high dollar political donor to flood a, a campaign with money, to uh, check and make sure that crime has been in kind of normal levels and when it spikes, send me alert. As a reporter, doing those things is often dreadfully boring. You're just going to a place and you're looking through things and, you, and, and it's often left to luck that the journalist is just smart enough to recognize a name or see a trend or things like that. That's not terribly efficient. A software bot can do that work for us. And as soon as it sees something and it flags it, oh, this is probably a story, sends it right to my eyeball because I'm wearing my glasses wherever I go. Software bots have been around for a long time. They're easy enough that I can program one. And if I can do it, anybody can. Um, the other Times uses these to great effects. They have all of the city of Los Angeles crime data in a mapping application. And any time crime spikes in a neighborhood, an alert is created. This is violent crime is high here, or, or property crime is high there. Um, people sign up for these alerts. They're able to get information from their communities, and there's no human being involved at all. It makes the organization much more efficient. They're able to do more with less. Well, what else? This is something that I'm really, really interested in, the idea of using UAVs to do journalism. Right here is one of my UCARE students, a guy by the name of Ben Kramer. And he is flying a quad rotor helicopter with a camera on it using an iPad. That's where we're at with this technology. We're able, this is like $300. The, 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 the quad rotor is the iPad, I wish it was only $300. But, um, <laughs> so that's the level of technology we're talking about. We're talking about anybody in the very near future could have their own UAV to do a job for them. If I'm a journalist and I get sent to a tornado, especially in a town that I don't know, the hardest thing to know is where to go. Where is it? Where's the worst of it? Where, where did the tornado come from and where did it go? What's the damage path? How wide? How far? Those things are very, very, very difficult to ascertain unless you're in the air. And to be able to do it for a few thousand dollars and for just pulling out a computer and saying, okay, I want you to go up 300 feet, pan around, take some pictures, land back down, pull the car out, and away you go. Just having that alone, just being able to broadcast that image of just how far the damage goes could completely change people's perceptions of disasters within a matter of minutes. Minutes. And those, those things are exceedingly difficult now. And we're near the point, uh, FAA permitting, that um, we'll be able to do this uh, for not very much money. One other thing I want to tell you about uh, real quick, there we go, is the Internet of Things. Microcontrollers and sensors are becoming cheap and easy to use, where anybody with, you know, anybody who can find a radio shack can build a wireless sensor network uh, that's as big as their budget will allow. Um, I've been working on a project and, and, and trying desperately to get funding people interested in a project where we would build a wireless sensor network of, say, a thousand nodes around Lincoln that would have noise sensors on them, and they would measure noise pollution in Lincoln, and they would map it in real time. 
We can look at a map and see exactly which neighborhoods were louder than others, which areas of the city were more noisy, and how that changed during the day. Nobody's keeping that data now, and it raises all kinds of interesting questions about how do we develop as a community? How do we build roads? Which roads do we expand? Which neighborhoods should we alter? Which roads should we alter in order to alleviate noise pollution? There's tons of research that says if you live in a noisy place, you will die younger than you will if you live in a quiet place. Noise causes stress. Stress causes all kinds of problems. So it's not, not exactly complicated. So that these things are becoming so easy, we have uh, a citizen science movement emerging in this country where people are able to measure things about their communities that they can't now or they must rely on the government to do. Well, we can do these things independently now. What if we combine these together? What if I build homemade radiological sensors and I happen to live near Fukushima and I, uh, and it just melted down. I have a UAV and I can just start placing these sensors around and I can independently measure radiation levels in the area. I don't need the government to tell me. I can actually check the government's numbers. I can see if they're telling us the truth. All amazingly powerful ideas that are not possible now, that could be very possible within the next year or two. So you're probably thinking, okay, this is a little sci-fi for me, friend. Um, and good lord, this must cost you know millions of dollars. And am I, am I talking about building a cyborg? No, not really. Because the reason is that uh, I grew up in newsrooms, I'm familiar with them, and the thing that you need to know about that publisher that just heartlessly laid off most of our staff, they're also notoriously cheap. So what I'm looking at is more like that. Uh, something more like the $6,000 man. And these technologies are just consumer grade stuff. These are, these are things that you can buy at Best Buy and, and Radio Shack and things like that. I think, I believe, that if we're able to harness these things properly, we're able to use them correctly, we can get newspapers and journalism into a much stronger place, and we can get journalists into the conversation about doing more with less. And thank you very much for listening.